Hello, and welcome back to Umineko. When last we left off, Beatrice had appeared, and a lot of people were discussing what this might mean and who she might be. Maria still hasn't come back. I wonder if she's getting scolded by Aunt Rosa again. Ever since they'd met Maria at the airport, she'd been romping around, chatting about Halloween the whole time. But maybe she'd cut loose a little too much. Acting a little too boisterous on the plane, on the boat, and during lunch. Because Rosa had cautioned her several times. At times like that, Aunt Rosa tended not to scold her much in front of people. More often, she would take Maria aside and scold her alone. So, since Maria had been called off somewhere, they figured she must be getting scolded. When they looked at the clock, they realized it was almost six. Of course, they couldn't imagine she'd been getting scolded all this time. Maybe it was time for some anime she watched every week to start. She probably hadn't left the mansion's parlor. Maybe Badly sama woke up and they've been playing together. After all, Maria-chan thinks of Badler-kun as a new friend. She must have had a lot of fun when she played Halloween with Badler-kun at the airport. Badler looked like he was having a lot of fun himself. Maybe he's gotten big, but he hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> That's true. I get the feeling Badler-sama was gracious enough to remain as he was six years ago. Shannon, do you remember what he was like then? Yes, because he was, well, very energetic. <laughs> I also remember the four of us playing together six years ago. Shannon acted a lot like a big sister back then. That's right. I get the feeling she was even more dependable than she is right now. <laughs> B -b back then, I, um, truly, didn't truly understand my place, so, um, I did quite a few rude things. <laughs> Don't worry about understanding your place in that sense. When you're on the job is one thing, but when you're taking your break and with us, like now, I'd rather you stay and be friendly, just like the old days. That's right. There's nothing wrong with acting differently, depending on whether you're the servant Shannon or the off-duty Sail. You aren't a slave. You're just working as a servant, right? I think of you, Shannon. No, Sail. As my oldest friend. Thank you very much, my lady. It seemed that Shannon understood the hidden meaning behind Jessica's words. After all, She'd heard a bit about Jessica and Cannon's history from both of them. Apparently, George had heard something of that history too. He walked towards the window and looked up at the darkening, rainy sky. Cannon may still be childish in some ways, but I think he's starting to grow a bit in his way of thinking. Well, uh... <laughs> C come on, quit it already. C well, I, I guess I let myself get swept away by the mood once or twice. You know, after watching you two, uh, I might have gotten a bit jealous, feeling like I was getting left behind. But 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 forget about me. More more importantly, how's it going between you two? Looks like it's going pretty good, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, I I wonder. Yes. It's going very well. Shannon was lost for words, her face red, while George answered brightly and immediately. That carefree attitude made it easy to see that their relationship was proceeding so perfectly it'd make anyone envious. Dang, I'm jealous. So does that mean Shannon's gonna resign and have a party soon? I, I wonder. I'm, uh... Oh, there's a good question. I wonder what she'll say. 
George laughed teasingly, as though pressing Shannon for an answer. It was probably the way they usually flirted when they were alone. Jessica could only smile bitterly and say, yes, yes, thank you, that's enough. I have a dream. I don't just mean some ambition to become the leader of my own domain in business. I also dream of building a happy family together with a partner I can spend my life with. I want two kids at the very least. It'd be nice to be able to do some sports as a whole family. And many more things besides that. I often talk with Shannon about that kind of thing. Though every time I do she always laughs and says I'm getting ahead of myself. For some reason, even at the age I am now, I find myself thinking about what it'd be like to live peacefully in my old age, with healthy grown-up kids and grandchildren running around all over the place. If only I could spend the rest of my life at a slow pace, surrounded by that, together with Shannon forever. Yeah, you're definitely getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> but how should I say it? Sounds like you, George Nissan. Being surrounded by a family like that would probably be so wonderful. The ideal family I've painted in my mind is something like that. To Shannon, who'd been raised in an orphanage, that harmonious image of a family was probably something to be yearned for. And George, who had made an absolute promise to grant that wish for her, may truly have been a fitting person for her to spend her life with. To Jessica, Shannon was a precious friend. George was surely the one most fit to entrust that friend's future to. Well, I don't want to throw cold water on you guys, but Uncle Hideyoshi aside, what are you going to do about Aunt Ava? Won't it be pretty tough to win her over? <laughs> There's no reason for anyone to worry about something like that. No one but me gets any say in who I choose to be my partner. I will bring Shannon happiness. Whose permission do I need for that? Whoa. <laughs> George Nissan, that was cool. Can't believe you can say that stuff embarrassing out stuff that embarrassing out loud. I don't remember you ever being that kind of character in the past. As they say, if you don't see a boy for three days, you should watch him closely. I grow as much as anyone. I intend to study more and more, and to grow and grow to be the man Shannon deserves, the one who can bring her happiness. Maybe even George realized how embarrassing the words coming out of his mouth were. His face turned very slightly red, and he scratched his head. George, son. It's okay. I'm sure mother will be difficult, but you can leave that to me. You'll see. I'll make all the relatives accept you as my partner. Awesome. I'm jealous of you, Shannon, seriously. Uh, um, I'm very grateful th that you're willing to go so far. Come to think of it, I'm starting to feel like a third wheel here. Maybe I'd better leave, huh? As Jessica rose with a forced smile from the bed she'd been sitting on, the phone rang. Before Jessica picked up the receiver, wondering what this could be about, Shannon looked at the clock and jumped. Apparently, she'd spent too much time on her break. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot it was time for work. Th then, if you'll excuse me. At the same time Jessica picked up the phone, Shannon began dashing out of the room. Ah, Shannon. Again, the usual time, at the usual place. Y yes. E excuse me. Hello, it's Jessica. Ah, Genji-san. Yeah, Shannon's going back to you guys now. 
We held her up. So please don't scold her. Yes, yeah, yes. I see. So it's almost time for them to get ready for dinner. Many plates were lined up on the counter in the kitchen. Preparations for dinner were proceeding steadily. The number of plates lined up there was 19. That was one more than should have been set up for the annual family conference. I can't accept it. Why can't I deliver it directly? Godasan flared up at Genji, paying no heed to the pot that was spitting steam. The master enjoyed eating alone in his study, so his food needed to be served in that room. However, that was something that always happened. Of course Godasan would want to set the table for the master with his own hands, since he'd put his heart and soul into his cooking. But the master had imposed a strict rule that none but the servants bearing the gold eagle crest enter his study. So while Godasan would be able to greet the master from outside the study, not once had he been granted the honor of carrying his cooking inside. Godasan was always irritated by this. Of course, he was a newcomer in terms of years of service. However, he had piled up plenty of experience from his previous jobs, and he was quite confident that he'd be able to perform in front of Kinzo in a manner that would do him no disservice. And yet, simply because he was not permitted to wear the Golden Eagle, he still hadn't been blessed with this honor. Can you imagine what damage that would do to his pride? You might think tonight was a repeat of that. But it wasn't, because tonight there was a person other than the master who wanted their food carried to their room. Apparently, this person is an extremely rare and honored guest, and we've been given strict orders to treat them in the same manner as the master, the family head. Godasan must have wanted to earn some points by serving this honored guest with his own hands. After all, he was an extremely vain person. If he wasn't qualified to serve the master, then at least a guest of the same rank? He simply couldn't find time during lunch, so Kanan Kun had gone in so Kanan San had gone in his place. So he truly desired to personally serve this person tonight's meal. The best dinner of the year. But Genji San had put a stop to that. Something about how Godasan didn't wear the Golden Eagle. After being told once more that he wasn't qualified, Godasan lost his patience. Ah, so heartrending, Godasan. I cannot do anything more than watch like this from the shadows. Kumasawa-san, if you have enough free time to dawdle around, please get the dining hall ready. Is the tablecloth set? Ho oh, ho ho, my apologies. When it became her turn to bear his wrath, Kumasawa slid out into the hall. Beatrice-sama is of exactly the same rank as the master. All rules regarding her are to be respected just as much as those involving the master. Godasan. Please devote your attention entirely towards your own task and serve all the relatives. I wouldn't mind if it was you, Genji-san, but is it really okay to let a child like this serve such a guest? If she made some blunder, it would be quite embarrassing. I know they've served here a long time, but that doesn't mean they've been trained in the proper areas. If you'll allow me to speak freely, they are completely lacking in the fundamentals that might qualify them to interact with such a guest. Goda spoke bluntly, even though Shannon was standing right there in the kitchen. Shannon was the one whom Genji had ordered to carry dinner to Beatrice's room. By the ranking system among the servants permitted to wear the Golden Eagle, Shannon certainly was the second highest in rank. If the highest ranked Genji went to set the table in Kinzo's room, then it fell to Shannon to set the table in Beatrice's room. Goda's pride was always horribly injured by this ranking system. 
At times like this, he'd speak out bluntly and crudely against Shannon and Cannon. Goda kept raising examples of each of Shannon's failures until now, making a ruckus about how she couldn't do this or was terrible at that. Shannon, who listened to this with her head hung in shame, heard Cannon's voice from behind her. Cannon had been leaning against the wall in the hallway, near the kitchen entrance, a blind spot from the inside, and had been listening to all of this. He probably knew that if he entered the kitchen, sparks would start to fly his way. I've got to say it. The man's scum. But, but, but we could learn a lot about the fundamentals of entertaining guests from him. Kodasan has learned so much, so he'd be a great reference. <laughs> Nissan, you sure are nice. More importantly, is the guest in the VIP room really Beatrice-sama, as they say? Yes. I met her when I was sent to serve her lunch. There can be no doubt it's her. Really? Was she doing well? Cannon remembered that he and Shannon had different impressions of Beatrice. To Shannon, Beatrice was a cupid of love who had granted her magic to establish her relationship with George. Judging by the expression that rose to her face, it looked like she couldn't wait to inform Beatrice of how her relationship with George had progressed. However, Cannon already knew. That witch came here with a terrifying goal in mind. The nebulous witch that only they'd been able to see in the past had now revived so fully that she could walk in openly through the front door and even have dinner carried to her. Once, when she'd vanished from in front of Cannon, the witch said something about how her own power was still weak. So, if that witch was now appearing so openly, did it mean she'd finally regained her former power? And she said something else too. She definitely said that she'd sown the seeds of love, while fully aware that they would fail. And she said even more. She definitely said that the day had finally come, upon which the door to the Golden Land would be opened. Shannon, she's planning to hold some bizarre ceremony with the Master, and you can bet it'll be something too horrible to imagine, and no one will be able to resist. What are you talking about? She came here. She came here as the Master requested, so that the door to the Golden Land would open, and so that everything would be returned to the Golden Land. She definitely said that to me. In the past, the two of them, as furniture working for Kinzo, had been told what opening of the door to the Golden Land meant. So Shannon understood everything without having to ask a single question. And because of that, she felt a deep despair. Something tore at Cannon's heart as he looked at that expression twisted with grief. How could... Why... Why now? Didn't I tell you? We are furniture. Because you acted like a human, because of love, you're incapable of obediently accepting the day our service comes to an end. Once, I wished this day would come, but it never came, year after year. I didn't know how long we'd be forced to endure suffering as furniture. So I thought, I thought that day of rest wouldn't come for all eternity. I thought the same thing, but I believed that it would definitely come someday, so I never forgot that I'm furniture. But Nissan, you did forget. It's my fault, isn't it? It was I who... Yeah, it's your fault, Nissan. 
If only you hadn't experienced love. We'd both be happy that this day has finally come. You built up too many pointless regrets. Even though you knew you'd have to leave this world someday. Will the ceremony begin tonight? Yes. And she said one more thing. Tonight, George Sama will probably give you an engagement ring, Nissan. That was a fact. George supposedly had an engagement ring hidden in his pocket today. And surely, he would hand it over tonight. She brought you two together, planning to use you as the sacrifices of the second twilight. Get it? She tempted you and took advantage of you. I see. I never thought of that. But she told me. She promised that if you don't accept the engagement ring tonight, you won't be chosen as a sacrifice, Nissan. I think our chances of being able to go to the Golden Land together are very slim. And there will be 13 sacrifices. Only 5 will be left alive. The chances of us being part of that group are tiny. But if you just accept her offer, those chances will rise. I want to take that bet. Our salvation is in the Golden Land. We're gonna reach that place and gain humanity. And then, I want to live life as a human, together with you, Nisan. If we do that, we might be able to find... True love. In the past, we used to dream about being able to go to the Golden Land. If we go there, any wish will be granted. We'll be saved from this pain. That's what we believed. However, in this ceremony, only a few people would be invited to the Golden Land, chosen by fate and chance. Everyone else would lose their life as a sacrifice, midway through the ceremony. However, in the past, Shannon and Cannon had thought that whether they reached the Golden Land or were sacrificed, they would still be released from their duties as furniture. That meant this ceremony would definitely bring release to furniture like them, no matter what happened. I don't like it. Together with you, I want to make up for all the suffering we've endured. I won't become a sacrifice. Nissan and I will remain alive, and we'll reach the Golden Land together. So I won't let you become the sacrifice of the second twilight. Please, Nissan, don't accept that man's ring. If you don't accept it, she promised not to select you as a sacrifice. I cannot do that. Tonight's ring is very special. My heart won't let me refuse it. Nissan, the sacrifices of the ceremony are decided on the witch's whims. And that witch has promised to overlook just you, Nissan. You alone will definitely be able to go to the Golden Land. Only me? What about you, Canon Kun? The witch's game is enough for me. I'll slip through her clutches. I am not powerless. I'll tightly grasp that faint chance. After all, our lives are transient, aren't they? In order to begin our real lives, let's drag ourselves to the Golden Land. Then, we will gain humanity. And when we've done that, maybe I'll be able to experience romance just like you, Nissan. Maybe I won't have to make someone cry just because I'm furniture. Canon Kun. I've had enough of being furniture. I'll definitely become human. I'll escape this pain. No matter what. There were tears in Canon's eyes. By now, Canon had noticed. Shannon hadn't been the only one to know and suffer from the taste of love. He had to. The tears Jessica had shown him that day, and Jessica's pitiful face as she tried to smooth things over and stay bright ever since then, 
had slowly wrought some kind of change on Cannon's heart without him knowing it. Shannon, I have been calling to you for some time now. Shannon jumped at the sudden sound of Genji's voice. Apparently he had called for her repeatedly. She hurriedly answered. When she turned back, Cannon had disappeared. It seemed he didn't feel like showing his tears to anybody. Y yes I'm sorry for being careless. I entrusted Cannon with lunch, but it should have been you as the next in rank after me who carried it. Beatrice Sama is the most honoured guest of this house. There is no more honoured guest than her. Please think of her as another master and be polite. Please take extra care that you make no blunders, understand? It is quite painful for me to entrust this to someone as inexperienced as yourself, but there's nothing we can do about the house's rules. Carry out your duties with the utmost of care. Goda had officially agreed, but he glared at Shannon with an expression that told her he definitely wouldn't forgive any mistakes. Even Shannon felt that Goda might as well go himself if he was so desperate to go, but she considered this one of her responsibilities, as one who had been allowed to wear the golden eagle and had to give up. And anyway, I wanted to meet Beatrice. What will I talk about? What will I ask? I don't know. Will this be a meeting of gratitude? Or one of grief? Or else, what? I don't know. Shannon piled the witch's food onto the serving cart and left the kitchen at a slow pace. The person knocking was Krauss. Father, today is our annual family conference. Haven't the siblings gathered here just to get a glimpse of you? Ah, be silent. I say I won't leave. You're there too, aren't you, Genji? Why haven't you had my food brought here as I ordered you to? Kinzo screamed across the door. Genji was waiting behind Kress. Your meal has been prepared so that it might be carried to the study. However, Krausama has expressed his wish that you eat downstairs tonight. Father, I'm not asking you to do this every day. Just for this one night, won't you gather together with your family? Who are you calling my family? Since when have you considered vultures circling in wait for roadkill to be family? Would you call rotting, oozing maggots family as well? <laughs> my my. Crest shrugged at this answer, which he had half expected. Genji, carry the meal here as you were told. Why don't you listen to what I say? Why? Why? <laughs> Genji-san. I leave this in your capable hands. My voice will no longer reach that man. Krauss gave his head a small shake, then quickly turned his back on the door to the study. He had only come calling to save face in front of his siblings, knowing full well how useless this was. After Genji watched Krauss disappear down the stairs, he called again across the door. Master. We have finished preparations for your meal to be carried here. Shall we bring some for Dr. Nanjo as well? Nanjo could be seen in the study. Because Kinzo had forcefully pestered him into finishing their long-lasting chess game, they had been playing against each other since the early evening. Nanjo had announced as a doctor that Kinzo's days were numbered. So he couldn't refuse if Kinzo demanded that they finish this game while he still lived. Kinzo was thinking deeply about his move, concentrating more than usual. It had been Kinzo's turn for quite some time, and Nanjo, who was tired of waiting, had randomly pulled out a book on magic that he couldn't understand, and was skimming it. 
Kunzo-san, you won't think of a good move just by folding your arms and sitting in front of the board. Perhaps we had better take a break and refresh our minds. Be silent. Mm. That should be enough to solidify my defense. Will the bishop and the knight be able to penetrate that opening? Hmm. Today, Kinzo was focused on maintaining a strong defense. Normally, Kinzo's motto was that offen offense was the best defense. However, today was completely the opposite. I'm also hungry. Shall we suspend the game here? Besides, I've used my head so much without a break that I'm already feeling dizzy. At this rate, I might not be able to perform at my best. Now that won't do. In chess, both players must always make their best moves. Any other sort of move is merely a nuisance to consider, ruining a game whose focus is predicting your opponent's thoughts. Such a thing considerably reduces our enjoyment. Kinzo sighed deeply and finally shifted his gaze away from the board. Chess isn't chess without an opponent. If that opponent is tired and wants to suspend the game, there's no getting around it. True, the goal of chess is for both players to make the best possible moves and aim for victory. It's an intellectual game where reading your opponent is key. But Kinzo-san, have you forgotten there's another goal besides victory? What? What other goal could there possibly be? Ha ha ha. To think that you of all people would forget something like that. Chess is a way to pass the time having fun with a friend. <laughs> You've got me there. I believe I once said those exact words to you long ago. Yes, you've got me there. Kinzo, who almost always wore a frown, relaxed his face for once and laughed. Nanjo felt like he'd been reunited with a close friend he hadn't seen in ages. That's how it is. Now that I've managed to take a shot back at you, what do you say? Will you go down with me and have dinner? Why don't we discuss Kasparov's middle game along with some coffee? An appealing proposition, but I'm afraid I must decline. I can no longer leave this room. After all, the ceremony has already begun. Is that so? Well, my stomach is growling. I will go downstairs. Anytime you feel like it. Nanjo. Thank you. Oh, what could you be thanking me for? We didn't finish our match. However, it seems I have somehow achieved that second goal of chess, which I had forgotten. And it would appear that goal is no less important than achieving checkmate. <laughs> this isn't like you. Why so sentimental? You said it yourself, did you not? My days in this world are numbered. Now go, and don't come to this room again. Let us continue this match in the Golden Land. That's fine with me, but we'll have to start over. Losing that rook was a serious blow. Well then, I will see you later. Yes, later. Maybe in the Golden Land, or in Purgatory, or possibly in the next world. Nanjo didn't say anything beyond that, and with a motion made smooth by familiarity, he pushed the button on the table that would release the auto lock. Then, after looking at Kinzo's back one last time, he left the study. As he did, Genji's voice came from the hall. If you are ready, master, I will now carry in your dinner. It may be my final dinner. I must savor it. Please, prepare it. As you wish. And are your preparations complete as well, master? Indeed. 
In the time leading up to this day, this room has been carefully wrapped in a multitude of barriers. Even if her roulette chooses me, I will definitely repel it. I will remain alive, and will surely become one of those who reach the Golden Land. I shall repulse the visit of the Reapers trying to drag me off to the Land of the Dead. Excuse me, I have come to serve your meal. Shannon entered the VIP room, bowing her head and pushing the serving cart. The young woman by the window, gazing out into the supposedly empty darkness, was definitely that witch. So, it is Shannon this time. How long it's been. Oh, your face isn't nearly as pale as it once was. I can see you're no cannon. I hardly recognize you. Thank you very much. Shannon solemnly prepared dinner. There were actually several things she wanted to ask the witch, but they were all jumbled up and she didn't know where to start. Her heart was also jumbled up and she didn't even understand her own emotions. So, she could only do her job dispassionately, with everything still vague. However, the witch saw what was in her heart. You can't hide anything from a witch. I won't apologize. I am a witch after all. Apologize for what? Come now, Canon must have told you about it. I only rescued your love life because of my mischievous spirit. It was nothing more than a seed I sowed, so I could watch your love grow complicated, become twisted and fail. I imagine some people think it's more fun to hear about love than to have it. You couldn't possibly be trying to thank me, right? I am. No matter what kind of ulterior motive you had when you gave me the magic of love, it doesn't change the fact that I received it from you. So even if you sowed that seed knowing that the two of us wouldn't be able to stay together for life, I won't hold a grudge against you. Hmm. It seems furniture is dull after all. <laughs> this is where I show my skill by cooking it into something interesting. I don't understand what you're thinking, Beatrice-sama. You are a great witch and people like us don't even reach your feet. Nor can we even imagine your grand thoughts. But there is at least one thing I can say. What is it? Thank you for teaching me to be human. You said it yourself. I am no longer furniture. Be silent, furniture! If you were a true human, hearing the announcement of your death on the day you were to receive an engagement ring should have you dancing around mad with grief. But what are you doing? Your face looks so enlightened as though you've accepted everything. Truly an anti-climax, furniture. No, I am not furniture. Be silent, furniture! I won't be silent, because I'm not furniture. Are you saying you won't obey my orders? Furniture obeys orders, but a human decides for herself whether to obey orders or not. So I won't obey your orders. Hmm. <laughs> I take back what I said. You really are interesting. If I hadn't sowed those seeds, you probably would have allowed the ceremony to control your fate without clinging to any emotions. But now you've grown to become something truly interesting. Something that will entertain me to no end. 
<laughs> that is well, for I am not fond of boredom. <laughs> Dinner is ready. Here you go. Hmm, doesn't this look delicious? If Goda makes it to the Golden Land, perhaps I shall commission him as my chief cook. I heard from Kanon-kun. Something about how, if I rejected George-san's proposal, you promised not to make me a sacrifice. Indeed, I said as much. You would make an ideal potential sacrifice for the second Twilight. But because Canon cried and screamed, asking that I spare you, I graciously listened to his words. With the condition that you abandon your engagement, of course. <laughs> See how gracious I am? What a foolish offer. And what a foolish threat. So you used that to thoroughly bully Canonkun, didn't you? Oh, so you comprehend. <laughs> apparently, Shannon had seen through it. She had apparently guessed at how the witch had bullied and humiliated Cannon with that horrible promise as bait. I made him crawl on the carpet and kiss my shoes. <laughs> and that's not all. Do you want to hear the other ways in which I humiliated him? Shannon silently shook her head. I've finally come to understand you. You like to bully, confuse, and trouble people, and you do it to entertain yourself. So now I know for sure the one single way I can resist you. And what might that be? I don't care about you. I'll carry out the fate that has been given to me. That's all. I won't entertain you. I don't care about you? <laughs> the witch's features twisted in hatred for just an instant. It disappeared immediately. But the expression that briefly rose to her face was rare for the witch, whose malice, whose malicious smile usually never faded for a second. <laughs> I see, so you might resist me in that way. How amusing. How truly entertaining. I'll kill you. You and your lover both. If that's the fate you've decided upon, do as you will. I won't be afraid and I won't stand against you. After all, I don't believe the cruel fate that's coming is something controlled by your will. We humans know nothing about fates that might come to pass in the future. That's why I'll live to the fullest until the last instant, following my convictions and the fate set before me. Fate is just a roll of the dice. There's no malice in it. Even if you claim there is, I won't believe it. Oh, so even though you've quit being furniture, you have no fear of death? It seems you believe this will bore me, but you couldn't be more wrong. The thought of seeing whether you can hold on to that view until the last moment merely serves to intrigue me more and more. <laughs> I can't stand this. Why did you take the form of a human, appear in front of us, speak with human words and ridicule us? If you hadn't appeared in front of us, if you hadn't predicted the future, we would have been able to live life to the fullest until the last moment. <laughs> That's what witches do. I live off your fates, reigning as a high order being does over low order beings. Your fates are nothing more than fragments. If I cut my hands together, I could scoop out as many of those as I want. Oh, and how are you planning to accomplish this? By walking away from this place right now. No matter how I respond to your words, it will only amuse you. 
Refresh refusing to respond to your questions is my only method of resisting you. I see, I see. You might be able to take a shot at me. But you cannot defeat me, yes? I have the power to kill anyone for eternity. I cannot wait to see whether you can keep up that resistance in an endlessly repeating cycle of death and rebirth. Don't you forget it, okay? You spoke those words yourself. <laughs> Well then, if you will excuse me, if you need anything, please call me. Shannon gave a reserved bow, bow and wa faced away. With that gesture, maybe she really did take a shot back at the witch, just as Beatrice had said. Because when the witch called out again, she sounded a little more quick-tempered than she had before. <laughs> Cannon thanked me. Can't you? Can't you thank me for bringing you your day of rest? Furniture may be happy when the day of rest comes, but I am a human, so I have nothing to thank you for. Is that all you have to say? You plan to accept George's ring, yes? Don't forget that if you do, I will abandon the promise I made with Cannon. The promise that you would not be selected as a sacrifice. If you need anything else, I'll have someone else come. If you will excuse me. A flat out interruption. Shannon still hadn't answered her. And the sound of the door closing came instead of an answer. Shannon's resistance probably struck far more deeply into the witch than Shannon herself thought. Because an expression of hatred once again rose to Beatrice's face. She had made Cannon submit even though he hadn't been ensnared until the end. Whereas Shannon, who had been so easily ensnared before, refused to submit this time. I see. So this state of affairs is amusing after all. <laughs> Perhaps I really am still young. This is why I haven't tired of life after 1000 years. This was the most fabulous part of the family conference. Dinner. In the past, when Kinzo had been serious about the conference, he'd taken everyone's yearly gathering for dinner very seriously. Because anything embarrassing that occurred during the dinner would cause the deepest shame for him as the host, he had given Natsuhi stern orders to avoid embarrassments at all costs. Because of that, she and Chris eventually hired Goda, who had confidence in his cooking abilities. Thanks to that, they became a they become able to serve wonderful dinners they could be confident in. But by that time, Kinzo had closed himself up in his study and never appeared for dinner. Maybe you could call that ironic. When the main dish for tonight, calf steak, was set out, Goda began to describe it proudly, further stimulating everyone's appetites. The sauce here is Bordelais. Of course, the red wine base I used was excellent, even among those made in Bordeaux. But in addition, I prepared an original blend of this house. A blend of choice alcohol from all from around the world to further deepen the taste. This sauce is limited to this year. I sincerely hope you all enjoy your meal. Isn't that wonderful? However, isn't Bordelais sauce common to French cooking? It almost seems like using alcohol from outside France with that France with that is heresy. Kressama, today is the annual family conference. As a dinner for those who normally live far away and who have travelled far from across the world to gather together. I realized it would be most fitting to have a sauce made from a blend of fine alcohols from all over the planet that have never met each other before. 
so I had it specially prepared. Wonderful! A truly wonderful cook, that's what you are. Food and medicine work twice as well if you sell it right. It's already twice as delicious as normal food and the advertising makes it twice as good as that. The taste keeps doubling and doubling. Wahahaha! <laughs> Come on, Nissan. That question of yours was obviously a plant. No doubt about it. You totally set Godasan up to steal the show on that one. <laughs> you think so? I thought there might be some people here who didn't notice that today's food was in the French style. After all, Ava just said that avoiding butter was a virtue, but that's the Spanish style. Well, I guess they do share a border, right? That's not what I meant. Will you please not take a part of the conversation out of context and make stuff up? It's a very delicious sauce. Godasan, you certainly are amazing. It is a great honor to receive your praise. And this is all thanks to Madam's habitual guidance. No, it was all Goda's idea. I only listened to the recipe and approved of it. It looked like the siblings quickly got into a loud argument about the sauce. But for the most part, dinner proceeded peacefully. However, a certain question they desperately wanted to ask burned inside each one of them. It was about that visitor, the 19th person. The Golden Witch. In actuality, Ava and Rudolf and the rest were very much on their guards during this meal. If the mystery guest was ever going to be introduced, this dinner table would be the most appropriate place to do it. However, no place was set at the dinner table for the witch. The family conference would begin in earnest after the meal, and previous experiences told them that it might last until deep into the night. However, they couldn't imagine why such a person should be kept hidden until that late, if they were going to be introduced in the end anyway. So, Ava and Rudolph and the rest were starting to feel a certain suspicion. Perhaps this guest was unknown even to Krauss. If this wasn't an assassin called by Krauss to give him an advantage in the inheritance problem, then maybe they should speak frankly to Krauss beforehand, creating a common front to resist anything disadvantageous to the four siblings. If she was Kinzo's assassin, whose purpose was to keep the inheritance from being handed over to the four siblings, the enmity between Christ and the other siblings could only become a weak point that benefited the enemy. Well then, please enjoy at your leisure. When he finished explaining the reasoning behind the table setting and the cooking, Goda tried to leave the room, but Kyrie called him to a stop with a small voice. Yes, Kiryasama? What is it? Um, please excuse me. I was under the impression we had company today, but can we expect to be joined at the dinner table? She had planned on saying it nonchalantly, but unfortunately it reached the ears of Natsuhi, who was sitting in the next seat over. It seemed that Natsuhi had heard it as, even though the guests are here, why hasn't the host come to dinner? In other words, that Kirihe had asked whether Kinzo was going to join them for dinner. The family head is not at his best, so he said he would take dinner in his study. I believe my husband explained that in the beginning. I'm sorry, that's not what I meant. Natsuhi's reaction instantly told Kirihe that this unknown visitor was also unknown to Kraus and his wife. Which meant... On the chessboard inside Kyrie's mind, she could hear the clattering of the pieces as they rearranged themselves. What do you mean we have company? Battler, who had been sitting next to Natsuhi, seemed to have heard Kyrie's words without misunderstanding them. Thinking it strange that someone else would be invited to today's family conference, he spoke up incredulously. And thanks to that, the uncomfortable feeling building in the siblings' chests suddenly exploded. 
everyone looked at Goda at the same time. Judging by their reactions, it was clear that no one here had invited that mystery woman. For an instant, Goda was startled to find everyone's gazes gathered on him, but because of his naturally vain personality, this actually gave him a feeling of superiority. Therefore, he answered in an extremely calm and graceful manner. That is correct. Our guest wanted to eat alone in the VIP room and is being served there. That extremely graceful and reasonable response of Goda's made it obvious to everyone that a 19th person, a visitor, existed. In the VIP room, a guest? What? Who are you talking about? Natsi's words echoed the question that everyone who didn't know about the appearance of the Golden Witch was thinking. For a while, Goda was disoriented, caught completely off guard by this sudden interrogation. This was a guest who had been treated with such deep respect. He hadn't imagined that Kraus and his wife might not even know about her. The, the guest is, um, Be Beatrice Sama. Beatrice! See? See? Beatrice came! Ooh, ooh, ooh! Maria had been telling the other cousins over and over again that she had met Beatrice that day. The cousins had answered flippantly, but they hadn't believed. So their eyes grew wide. S sorry I totally thought you were joking, Maria. S so she really was there! By Beatrice? You mean that Beatrice with the gold? Ooh, I've been saying she exists the whole time. No one believes. So sorry, Maria-chan. That's not how we meant it. After learning that everyone had doubted Beatrice's existence, Maria, who had been in a good mood all day, completely lost her temper. George, who sat in the next seat over, tried frantically to calm Maria. Goda, is this some sort of dinner entertainment? <laughs> quite a performance. Anarchy, quit playing dumb. You called her here, right? Called? Called whom? From where? Nissan, let's be clear about this. Who is she? Surely you aren't going to tell us it really is the Beatrice from that portrait, right? I don't have a clue what you people are talking about. Goda, you really aren't joking, right? I, I, um... I was just ordered by Genji-san, um... Call for Genji. Immediately. When Natsuhi yelled, Goda sped out into the hallway. The sound of the door being thrown open was the spark that suddenly set the dinner table ablaze. So, you're saying you're in the dark too, Anaki? Who called her? Was it Dad? I don't know anything about this. It seems you people think I've been pulling the strings behind the scenes, but that's a huge misunderstanding. Calm down, Krasny-san. We've gone past the stage of our skirmishing with each other. If you're saying even you don't know this mystery person, then something crazy's going on. Hideyoshi-san, can't you be a little more discreet with your words? My husband would not invite unnecessary people to the family conference. Obviously. What are you people talking about? Are you saying the witch of the portrait has broken out of her frame and appeared? It's not as though anyone's actually met this witch face to face. I met her. Ava and Rudolf nodded at Rosa's proclamation. Ooh, I met her too. Uncle Kraus, believe it. Believe Mama. Ooh. ooh. The brief tension was broken and Maria also started to make a ruckus. By now the room was thoroughly wrapped in chaos. I, d I don't have a clue what's going on. So what does it mean? Does it mean the witch who gave grandfather the gold is showing up as a special guest this year? But is that really true? Aunt Rosa didn't see it wrong, did she? I met her too! Ooh, 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 ooh! Aunt Rosa? Are you sure? 
Yes. Maria and I met her, and we even talked to her. I met her. That was definitely a witch. Believe me, I definitely didn't see it wrong or hallucinate or anything. What on earth was that? In the instant before the typhoon arrived, Rosa definitely met a witch in the Rose Garden. But the scene had been so hard to accept as truth, that the more she spoke of it like this, the less she understood what it was she had encountered. Ironically, since she was losing her composure, the more frantically she tried to cling to her claim, the more confused and hazy the thing she was describing became. Because of that, it only took a single, calmly spoken sentence to confirm the nature of what she was describing beyond doubt. I also met with her. I greeted. Well, I couldn't really call it that. I exchanged a few words with her. It's definitely not something that Rosa-san just saw wrong. Kyrie-san, are you serious? Yes. But she didn't tell me her name. So I can't say for certain that she was Beatrice. However, and sorry if this is subjective, but since I met her in the entrance hall, I was able to compare her face with the portrait. My first impression was that this portrait has to be hers. This is all just subjective. That isn't possible. In the first place, where did that woman come from? The only boat arriving today was the one that brought all of you here. Was she on that boat? Well, it's hard to say for sure. Of course, I don't remember any woman like that getting off the boat with us. Oh, is that all? Can't you prove there wasn't a boat besides the one we rode on? You can't. You can't prove one didn't arrive. Makes sense. If another boat did arrive, it might be possible to prove it. If someone saw it and said they saw it, then you're done. But it's impossible to prove that such a boat didn't arrive. Even if everyone says that no such boat arrived, that they didn't see it arrive, you can't prove that it didn't arrive secretly. It's just that thing they call a devil's proof. It'd be simple to prove that devils exist. All you have to do is meet a devil. But it's impossible to prove that devils don't exist. Just by saying that no one has ever met a devil, you can't deny the possibility that they're hiding away somewhere humans can't go. You can't deny the existence of aliens for exactly the same reason. Until humanity searches the whole of space and can show perfectly that aliens don't exist, you can't be sure that they don't exist. And it's definitely impossible for us to check the entirety of space for the existence of aliens. Therefore, while there may be a number of ways to prove that aliens do exist, it will always be impossible to show proof that denies their existence. So, any discussion about there being a second boat would just be a waste of our time. She wasn't on the boat with us. That much is a fact. So she must have arrived on this island through some other means. That's right. There may be no need to discuss how she came here. What's important is that she's actually in this mansion now, and doesn't feel like having dinner with us. Okay, let's review. Right now, there's another guest on this island, other than the 18 people of the Asheramiya family. And this is a guest even Anaki and Natsuhi-san don't know about, right? I know nothing! I don't know what you're talking about! Be silent for now. Your headache will get worse. It's as my wife says. I have no idea what you people have been talking about up until now. Then there can be only one answer. Father called her here. Called her here for today's family conference. For the family conference? Again? Why? I don't know that. I'm questioning you because I thought you might know. A Ava, could you give it a rest? Krasny-san said he doesn't know. So here's what we've got. Father stealthily invited the Witch of the Portrait as a secret guest. And she met with Rosa-san and Maria-chan and then Kyrie-san. That's all for now. 
If she has something to say to us, she could just show herself right away. Now we've got to wonder why she's shut herself up without greatness. Does this mean Dad, who never gave a crap about this family conference in the first place, secretly called a new mistress here? <laughs> and had her wear the clothes of his ideal witch? This day's too important for that explanation to fly. There can be only one reason. To join in on the family conference. She wants to claim some right to father's inheritance. Ridiculous. The family head wouldn't have said have something as filthy as a mistress. I told you to be quiet. I've lived in this mansion with father all this time, and I've never heard a thing about something like that. If we stretch plausibility to the limit, and assume father had an illegitimate child with some mistress decades ago, then maybe father searched her out and called her here today. Is that what you're trying to say? Dear... It's absurd to think father has such a child. To waste the noble blood of the Shermia family on a mistress. This is nothing more than a few people making wild claims. It's obviously a fantasy, a delusion, a daydream. Or is everyone taking part in some kind of act to trick my husband? What act? If anyone's acting, it's you. Quit it, Anarchy. Natsuhi-san may be a bit over vehement, but she's right. Kyrie saw her. I didn't. Neither did you, Anaki. But Rosa did. But that means she exists. There are people who can prove she exists, so we're sure right away that she does. It's the opposite of a devil's proof. And I want to meet her too. I want to ask her directly what kind of business she has with the Ashuramiya family. I agree with you on that. I do indeed wish to inquire as to what business she has on Rakanjima. Don't play dumb. There is only one thing she could be after. Father's inheritance. We should work out our future plans with a lawyer who's hot on inheritance issues. If the mistress claims equal rights as mother, then our shares will be cut right in half. W wait a second, everybody. Genji-san will come very soon. He knows everything. I'm sure he'll answer our questions. Until then, let's stop talking about this. Hey, you kids. Sorry, but the adults have to start talking about something complicated. Return to the guest house. Rosa yelled at the children, slightly overcome with emotion. The children didn't understand why they were suddenly being yelled at this time, but Ava and the rest realized it too late. They were talking so bluntly about the filthy topic of the inheritance right in front of the children. Of course, they wouldn't want their children to remain. So they all immediately agreed with Rosa's plan. Th that's right, just as Rosasan says. George, take all the cousins and go back to the guest house. You all play nice together. George, do as you're told. Take all of the cousins and leave right now. W wait a second, mother. We still haven't finished eating. Ooh, and dessert hasn't even come yet. Ooh. We will have Godasan. We will have Godasan take dessert to the guest house. So leave. Jessica, from here on, the adults will be talking together. Go. Ch sure. Even though I'm still eating. Well, guess I won't be the only exception. Thanks for understanding, Badlerkin. But you sure are lucky. Huh? Why? I'd want to leave if I could. Hehehe. <laughs> I bet. I'll let you adults enjoy your happy family chat about the inheritance. I will also leave my seat. At any rate, it appears my turn will not come tonight. Nanjo quietly rose to his feet. From his seat in the farthest corner, he had been calmly watching the whole discussion without butting in. Surely, that reaction of his was very adult. Just what you'd expect of a calm old gentleman. When Nanjo rose from his seat, it ended up encouraging the others who were supposed to leave. The children noisily rose from their seats, and as they hurried into the hallway, the servants returned. I apologize for taking so long. I have called Genji. I was checking to see that all of the doors and windows were shut, so it took some time. My apologies. 
Come on, children, to the guest house. Goda-san, my apologies, but could you carry the children's portion of the dessert to the guest house? Aha. Is, is that what you wish? It seemed Goda wasn't amused to see the dinner he'd worked on so hard, he'd worked so hard on, interrupted like this. He sent Natsuhi a look, as though asking her whether that was really okay. Do as Goza-san says, and it will not be necessary to set out dessert for us. Do not approach the dining hall until we call for you. Tell the rest of the servants to do the same. Understood? Y yes a as you wish. Come on, come everyone. Shall we go? Maria-san, you mustn't trouble your mother anymore. Ew, ew, ew. I want to talk about Beetle too. No, no, no. Ew, ew, ew. Maria-chan, could you tell us about Beatrice in the guest house? I really want to hear about the witch. Okay? Ew. Ew. You're pretty darn smooth, Georgie san I'm impressed. Are you sure you don't have kids? You're totally used to this. <laughs> George's words had completely restored Maria's good mood, and now she took the initiative, telling the others to head on to the guest house. It looked like Goda didn't like being kicked out himself, but he couldn't disobey Nazi, so he left the room with Battler and the rest, closing the door. Is there some way I might be of service, everyone? Yeah, there sure is. We've got a whole bunch of questions. In fact, every one of us does. So much that we almost want to have a lottery to see who gets to ask first. <laughs> but no matter who wins the first lottery, the first question will be the same, won't it? That's alright. Genji-san, answer me honestly. Who is? This person called Beatrice in the VIP room right now. And that's going to do it for this week. Well, we jump a whole bunch of time ahead next time to 10 o'clock. But until then, thanks for watching. See you next time.